Gentlemen, we're in chapter 22. What a shock. And uh, we have minor problems going on. Maybe those will be corrected, maybe they won't. Okay, so that minor problem was corrected. That minor, okay, now you can go to sleep. The lights are off. Can I get a copy of this file so, right here? Right now, immediately, no, no. sitting in, while sitting in your chair. No, okay. Yes. I'm All right. Do you say so? Wow, look at that. That is so hosed. Yes, it is. All right, so what is what is our major malfunction here, anyway? All right, there we go. Back to that. For some reason, my uh, my smart board dealy dab isn't very smart, so I, I just use this guy up here. Okay, so operational amplifier, high gain DC amplifier has a uh, high input impedance, a low output impedance has two inputs, a positive and a negative, and power supplies that are plus and minus. The reason your power supply that's at your workbench has there's two power supplies there is so you can have a plus and minus power supply. The sole reason for that is so that you could build operational amplifiers in, in your proto boards. So what you would do is you'd run a jumper wire from the negative of the A guy to the positive of the B guy that that's now your neutral and then your positive is positive and your negative is negative on the other guy and that's how you get a plus or minus power supply what's inside that operational amplifier is interesting but it's sitting on a chip and there's nothing we can do about it so it, it's an integrated circuit guy that's sitting there on the chip and it comes in several parts comes into a differential amplifier right here. It's going to amplify the difference between the two inputs. And then it has a, a linear amplifier in the middle where it's going to take that difference and, 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 make, and make it bigger. And then it's got a power amplifier at the end where it's going to add power to that signal so that if it's supposed to be 5 volts on the output, it's 5 volts on the output whether your, your load is a 1K load or a 10K load or a 100 ohm load you're starting to get 5 volts no matter what the load is because I have a power amplifier sitting there on the output and you can see the, that that um, what do we call that a totem pole thing there sitting there and you can see the differential guy sitting there and you can see the power guy sitting there maybe you can okay so um, I could ground the the minus 5 volt part of the operational amplifier. I could do that. Um, I don't want to, but I, I could. If I did, then I could never see a negative voltage on the output. The voltage can only be positive. I can't think of any good reasons for that to happen. Um, we have some prefix to identify them, some designer thing, 7, 741C. 741 is the one we're going to be using in the lab all the time. I've got, got several hundred of them laying around. Um, they replace just about every, every one that there is. Um, if I need to go faster or I need something different, then I can buy a more expensive one and put it in. But in general, I probably don't need to. Um, an N means isn't that nice. It's a, it's a packaging type. So sometimes it's in a can sitting with, with pins coming out. Sometimes it's in a dual um, dual pin device thingy. Uh, ours are mostly in the dual pin device thingies. But I do have the older ones. Um, they're analog devices. They ha come in three grades, commercial, industrial, and military. So basically, I, I build 100,000 of these guys. All 100,000 are commercial. I sent a technician down to separate out uh, some of the good ones, those become the industrial ones. I set the technician down with a different set of standards and pick out of the 100,000, I pick out the 100 best ones. Those are now the military ones. 
So each of these guys have a, a specification of how far they can change on temperature, how far they can change on voltage, what they can do, but basically that's what I end up doing. Same thing with resistors. I make a million 1K resistors. I set a technician down to see which are plus or minus 1% and charge you more for it. They could be surface mounted. They could be a dual inline package. Um, they could be a ceramic type guy. They could be plastic. They could be any number of different things. So my dual line guy, uh, I have pin 1 that's going to be null. I'm going to have plus or minus power supply at 4 and 7. I got some offset. Uh, doesn't matter where in my, my input, 1 and 2. 2 and, two and 3, input 2 and 3. When I have it on a, a can, and this is going to be a, a piece of metal sitting up on, on top of things, there's a tab showing me where 8 and 8 is, and I'm going to go counterclockwise to find 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are the same that are here. Why we put the diddy dip on 1 and we put it over here on 8, I don't know. You know but we do. We haven't changed that ever. If it's surface mounted and I want to replace it, then I'm looking at $10,000 worth of really cool stuff in order to get it off and get it on right, right? Um, if it's not surface mounted, then I can replace them. It shouldn't be a problem. I've replaced the can, can ones by cutting the wires off of them and then mounting a chip holder on, on those wires. So I, I've done that before too when I needed to. All right, so we have a differential amplifier. It amplifies the difference between the input voltages. So if V1 is higher, I'd expect the output to be negative. If V2 is higher, I'd expect the output to be positive. But it's a differential amplifier. There is no current flowing through the operational amplifier from the, from the inputs. The impedance is extremely high on those inputs. I don't have current flowing that way. Um, we're saying the same thing again. We have an open loop gain. And, um, and that gain is something greater than 100,000. It says 10,000 there, but it's, um, I've never seen one at a mere 10,000. I've seen them at 100,000, 200,000, a million gain. Now, if I have an operational amplifier giving me a million gain, and I have 7 volts going into it, do I have 7 million volts going out? No, because I'm going I'm to be limited to the plus or minus power supply that's powering this guy, and I'm going to be limited to whatever that is, minus a 0.7 drop across one of those stupid diodes that were in the way. So if I have 15 volts plus or minus, um, then I'm, I'm going to have a 14.3 high, a 14.3 low is, is my swing. And if I have a million gain, then I, I, if I have a, a 1 millivolt going in, then I'm saturated, I'm peaked high. If I have 1 microvolt going in, then I'd see 1 volt out. So uh, that, that's the way that would work. So if, if I'm doing it as an open loop system, I'm doing it so that it, it swings into saturation either way. So I'm using it as a, 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 a digital device. It's either on or it's off. Not a very um, useful way to use an operational amplifier. Um, I go and I throw in a feedback resistor and now the feedback resistor tells the, the system what the output is and now I end up having a a closed loop. So I have a feedback path coming from the output to my input and now I have a different guy. So now my plus or minus, there's not much difference in the voltage so this guy's grounded basically. It has a virtual ground that'll show up in the next slide probably. That virtual ground requires some current to flow through that resistor to ground. So whatever Vn divided by Rn is, that's the current flowing through that resistance. That same re current has to flow through that resistor, so V out has to be minus um, that current divided by times that resistance, right? V is equal to IR. So whatever, this is zero, 
because I have no difference between those two guys. And so my voltage there has to be whatever the current was that went through that guy has to go through that guy. I was at zero, and I would go down some, something else. All right. So let's see what, uh, so yeah, so my difference in the voltage, V2 minus V1, um, and now I'm saying that um, the positive guy is bigger than the negative guy. I see a positive voltage out. The negative guy is more negative than the, than the positive guy, so I'm going to see a positive voltage out. Um, I'm more negative, I'm more positive on the negative guy, I'm going to see a negative voltage out. So basically, if I, it, it, whatever the voltage is, in is, I'm going to be inverted on the out. If I go in on the positive side, then I'm not going to get inverted on the way out. But if I, my signal, I ground the positive side, my signal's coming in the negative side, I'm going to invert the signal. I ground the, the negative side of this guy, I send in a signal, and I get, I, I'm not inverted anymore. And that's what negative means. Negative means I'm inverting it. Whatever it used to be, it's now the other way. Thank you very much, screen. We'll go back. Voltage supplies. Um, I've already said that. If, if I have plus or minus 5 volts, I can swing plus or minus 5, minus the 0.7 of the dial going across it. And um, so this is an ideal guy. We don't have any 0.7s. Um, but if I ground the negative side, I can only get positive voltage out. If I, if I grounded the, neg the positive power supply and put negative voltage on the negative guy, on the power supply, then I would only get negative voltages out. That's all I could do. Um, what does this show? Peak voltage cannot be reached uh, in either way, right? Some voltage is dropped across the, the diode, right? Okay, so that's good. So I got some peak voltage going in, and uh, so if I'm going to put 5 volts on the power supply, then I'm going to get 4.7. That doesn't look like 4.7, but I sw uh, that's my swing. All right, well, isn't that a nice graph? This is what the differential amplifier looks like. So, um, there was a time when I think I knew how that worked, but I'm not sure I know how that works anymore. That was when I was younger, like, you know, in my 50s. Where's the input signal? No. See, here's my output signal. But where did... Where did... Um, I would think that that's the power supply produces an output proportional to the difference of the two inputs. Isn't that cool? Oh, here we go. Here's the here's the input right there. That's where it is. That's the positive input. That's the negative input. And, and right now they're both grounded, so that means that there's no difference between them. I should see no voltage across my output. Okay, so that's what should happen. All right. And now we're seeing a signal coming in, and I'm, I'm grounding the negative side, and I see that I have some signal being generated. So this is not external to the operational amplifier. This is internal to the operational amplifier during the differential amp in the differential amplifier part of it. Something that we can never see. Um, modes of operation. So I can have a single ended mode. I can send a signal into only one input. I can have a double ended mode. I can have signals going into both. Or I can have a common mode where identical signals are applied to both inputs. 
wait a minute, if I have identical signals to both inputs, I should get a zero voltage out, right? Right. Well, this is not an ideal world, so the thing is going to give me something, and that something is going to get amplified, and it's called noise, right? So we have a thing called um, common mode rejection ratio. And we want to be able to reject the common mode in our operational amplifier, the thing that's common to both. Okay, and normally that's like 100,000 or 1 million rejection. So if I get one volt, in, volt of common going in to both guys, then I reject it all the way down to a millivolt, microvolt something really small. I want to reject it because I don't want it at all. I'd rather not have it at all. But, um, output offset voltage. Okay, so um, there could be an imbalance in, inside the differential amplifier that will have to be offset. So I, I set up my operational amplifier and I put my test stuff on it, and I see that I'm supposed to, I want 5 volts, and I'm seeing 4.3. So I have <coughs> an external resistor that I'm going to tweak on to raise it to the 5 volts that I want. So I'm offsetting the DC output by throwing in a resistor, and we'll see where that resistor goes. There we go. So I've got, it's a null adjust offset thing that's on my operational amplifier. Pins that I normally don't use unless I have to. But if I, if so, let's say that um, got an operational amplifier, it's putting out 5 volts, everything's fine. And I decide, you know, I really don't like this 100 feet of wire run, I want it to go 1,000 feet. Um, probably not going to happen, right? So I set the null adjust to add another 5 volts, and now i got 10 volts that might be enough to get all the way down there. And when it gets down at the other end, it's probably only going to be 5 volts anyway, and life will be wonderful. Input offset current. There's a slight difference between the two input currents that could cause a mismatch mass in, uh, between the transistors. Uh, we're going to offset this with an, an, an offset voltage. So I'm going to throw in a uh, resistor on the, on the, in this case, I have an inverting operational amplifier. I'm going to throw in a resistor that's a compensating resistor. So the C for RC is compensating, and it's going to be used to get rid of that mismatch of current that is, that is internal to the operational amplifier that I can't do anything else with. And I might make this a variable guy so I can tweak on him to get him to where I really want him to be. Input bias current. The inputs on the operational amplifier, there's some amount of DC biasing going on, um, and we might have to do something to uh, fix that as well. And what are we going to do? Okay, well, here we go. Common mode rejection ratio. Okay, the, the voltage gain of the differential amplifier divided by the voltage gain of the common mode. This needs to be a huge number. Um, we have identical signals being applied simultaneously to the two inputs. That, was a, that makes it a common mode signal. Common mode rejection ratio, the ability for an amplifier to ignore that common mode thing. So my differential gain is 100,000. That probably isn't. Uh, maybe 500. 500, and my gain of the common mode is 0 0.000001, then this is going to be a huge number. I'm going to reject it in a large way. So for this particular guy, the common mode re um, rejection is 77 dB. So that begs the issue, what does 77 dB look like? Well, we're not going to be able to use that today for whatever reason. Um, so I've got 77 dB. What does that mean? 
um, voltage gain is 10, 20, 20, 20 log. Why? Twenty log. Why is this thing so slow? Wow. That's slow motion. Um what if I need to log off and log back on? I don't, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of things turned on, do I? My toy's never done that before. It's an electronic thing. It's not supposed to do things like that. No, it's still doing the same thing. Um, we we'll plug it into a different port and see if that helps any. That doesn't help at all. Okay. So, um, Output short circuit. So if I if I short the output, I'm going to have to have some maximum current rating. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to be able to draw 5,000 amps and blow everything up, right? So uh, I have a maximum current rating. Um, I've got some maximum skew rate. It's going to take time for the signal to make it through the operational amplifier. So if I if I increase the signal at too high of a frequency, it's not going to be to keep up. Okay, And that's going to be whatever that that rate is divided by 2 pi voltage, the peak voltage. And we measure this, this skew rate in volts per microseconds. So I got a, I got a, a, a 10 meg signal. Am I keeping up? Yeah, I got a 10 gig signal. Am I keeping up? No way. Operational amplifiers are not going to be any good at all in gigahertz. They're not going to be any good at all in 100 megahertz. Um, the, top, the top range of frequencies are going to be somewhere around 10 megahertz. So for, it's an analog thing. So as, as we have the satellite communication stuff putting out things at really super high frequencies, we need different types of circuits to to receive and amplify them. So what happens if, if uh, my input waveform is looking like this, uh, my output could look like that. If my input is looking like this, my skew rate, I can't keep up. So I can't keep up, so I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna have rounded corners on my output waveform. So as my, my frequency gets higher and higher, I end up with a triangular wave coming out of that thing. So um, typical values, 2 meg input resistance, um, output resistance 75 ohms. Um, the the re output resistance is going to change based on the frequency. So at 100K, at 75 ohms, at 1 meg, it's going to be 200 to 3,000, 300 ohms. Um, that's because of the circuitry inside the operational amplifier. As I change my frequency, my characteristics of my output impedance is going to change on me. Other characteristics. Input voltage range. Uh, maximum differential, uh, let's say, large signal gain. Um, 
I have an open loop, uh, whatever it is. Supply current rating, power consumption. These guys are going to are going to soak up power, operating or not. Um, they're probably going to need a heat sink if you have something with lots of power going through. All right, now we have an inverting amplifier. And what is the voltage out? The voltage out is going to be um, the difference of voltage times whatever the gain is, the open loop gain is. Well, if the open loop gain is a million, then the chances are this is just going to go uh, plus or minus, into saturation, plus or minus side as, as, my, as my signal happens. I have a virtual ground on an inverting amplifier because I, my plus and minus things are grounded. That means that the plus and minus guy can't be very far from each other. If I'm ground on the plus guy, I have to be grounded on the, on the negative guy. But a virtual ground does not allow current to flow through it. So whatever current is coming from my voltage in, I have that same current flowing through my feedback resistor. That's what it looks like is happening. What's actually happening is something else. We don't really care what that something else is because we want to know what it looks like. We call the operational amplifier an active device. It's actively participating in the circuit. So if I have a circuit that's just induct uh, resistors, inductors, capacitors, those things are all passive. I go and I put a signal on it, it's going to act in a passive way. Um, if I take an operational amplifier, it's an active device. It's going to add power. It's going to change the voltage. It's going to do all kinds of cool stuff. Closed loop gain. Okay, so I've got a, I've got a, um, a virtual ground sitting at the negative person. So my voltage in has to be um, whatever the current ends times the uh, resistance in, that has to be the voltage. Um, the voltage out, that same guy has to come this way, that same current that flew through, went through that resistor has to flow through this resistor. That's my voltage out. The definition of voltage gain is voltage out divided by voltage in. The two currents have to be the same. Therefore, my uh, closed loop gain the feedback resistor divided by the input resistor. Neg normally we put a negative sign in front of that saying that the signal was inverted. Why we ha don't have that here, I don't know. The, um, the impedance in to an operational amplifier is approximately the resistance in to the operational amplifiers. So um, the operational amplifier has an infinite impedance but the resistance in to the circuitry is just that R in that's sitting in front of it. So this R in, we call that the impedance in. All right, when we calculate the impedance out, um, we look at the output impedance of the operational amplifier, usually less than 100. because RF is so much greater than, than the Z out of the operational amplifier. The Z out wins. And basically you could say, well, gee, they're in parallel. The Z out of the operational amplifier is in parallel with RF. Okay, so if RF is 1 meg ohm and Z out is 100 ohm on the amplifier, then Z out of the, of the amplifier itself would still be 100 ohm. So that's what we normally say. Common mode rejection ratio, the um, closed loop gain divided by the, the gain of the common mode. Common mode being a sig the same signal putting, being put on both input pins. And now we have a non-inverting amplifier. We go and we throw a, a signal onto the positive side. Now in this, in this case we do not create a phase shift of the signal. The phase shift stays the same. We have some feedback loop going on. 
normally we would draw this circuit underneath so we'd have RF coming down this way and we'd invert this guy so the positive guy would be on top but that's okay we'll handle it um, when I get done with the math involved I end up with the, gain, the closed loop gain for a non-inverting amplifier RF divided by RN plus 1 so for an inverting R amplifier no plus 1 for the non-inverting amplifier I get a plus 1 out of the math um, amplifier input impedance um, is extremely high Amplifier output impedance is extremely low. Isn't that lovely? How many times have I said that today? And uh, here's a picture of everything we've said all in one spot. Are we done with chapter 22 yet? No, we're not. Um, play with my toy song. This guy have batteries? I don't think so. I'm thinking about doing a homework problem. But I think I need my toy back in order to do a homework problem. So we'll see if my toy will play. Okay, I have a voltage follower. I'm going to have zero feedback resistance so other than the wire I have some voltage in the difference between the plus and minus has to be very close to nothing because that's what we do if it's very close to nothing then whatever I have there I have to have here and therefore I'm following my my gain is going to be one and I'm going to follow the uh, whatever voltage I have in I'm going to get it coming out now why would I want to do that well, the operational amplifier is going to add power to the signal. So I've got a wimpy-ass signal going plus or minus 5 volts, and if I put any, any load on at all, it's going to go away completely. I put, an, I put a voltage follower in there, and now it takes the wimpy-ass signal and turns it into a masculine thing that can, can deliver all of the awesome um, uh, 50 milliamps, millivolts, milliwatts, milli something, some power. Okay, so that, that's a voltage follower circuit. Now, there's a frequency gain, frequency response of my, of my operational amplifier. There's some cutoff frequency caused by the capacitance internal to the operational amplifier. It's going to cause a 20 dB per decade drop um, in the frequency response. Yeah, 20 dB per decade. So I, I go from some critical frequency times 10, some critical frequency times 100. That's one decade, one order of magnitude faster. And then I, I have some, some uh, frequency drop. So above that, frequency is less than that. I, I get all the gain that I want. As my frequency increases, I start getting hosed until I get down to a unity frequency where... The frequency is such that whatever the signal goes in, I get it back out. Okay, so here's my frequency response. Uh, I, I have 106 dB uh, normally and uh, 200,000 gain. All right, so when I, when I get up to 1 megahertz, I'm at unity gain. And um, if I go above that, I end up losing my signal altogether. <coughs> so the closed loop gain times critical frequency 2 is going to be where the unity gain is going to be. And this is called the, the bandwidth product. So the bandwidth product is where the unity, the frequency of the unity gain is. Now, um, 
in your in your labs, there will be a lab where you'll be doing that, where you'll be increasing the frequency and seeing the, the gain go down. Um, all right, operational amplifiers as comparators. So uh, is something true or false? So I have a comparator. When I, when I reach my high point, I end up, I, that I want to get to 10 volts. So I've got some signal. When I, when I get to 10 volts, I turn on. When I drop less than 10 volts, I turn off. So I'm comparing my signal coming in to the 10 volts of the reference, and sometimes I go up, sometimes I don't. Here's a, a variable type thing. I got some variable voltage source, two different resistors. I got a, I got a a signal, that, uh, a voltage divider circuit, so that I I set some voltage on uh, negative, so that I can figure out. Normally, these guys would have to be um, variable resistance, so I could set the the set points that I wanted. I wouldn't throw in solid guys. Um, another comparator circuit, doing the same thing. Uh, an integrator, an operational amplifier can do integration. So the integration of a square wave is a triangular wave. It's being inverted, so as I add up the area under the curve, I become more and more negative. When I add up the area under the curve, I become more and more positive because it's, it's, an, it's an inverted signal. So the integrated will convert my square wave into a triangular wave. Um, the area under the waveform is going to be whatever the peak value of the waveform is times the pulse width. So there's my area. And uh, as time goes on, I get more and more and more and more and I build. So now I've got, this is a, another integrating circuit a capacitor compared to a capacitor discharging. So this is my capacitor discharging, my capacitor charging as my, as my input voltage changes. My operational amplifier would be a triangular wave. Much better. Um, so here, here's my integrator again. I, I've thrown in a capacitor in my feedback path, and I integrate. In, in the 50s, our, we didn't have digital computers as much as we do today, and we had analog computers up the yin-yang. We were using these circuits to do integration and differentiation in analog computers in, in multiple military applications. Today we wouldn't do that. Today we would use microprocessors and digital circuits. We can have a, a differentiator which measures the slope of the curve. So that slope of that curve right there is some negative number that's being inverted and I'm giving me a positive number out. Um, so the slope of the curve is positive, it's going to give me a negative number out. Slope of the curve is negative, it's going to give me a positive number out. So I, I can I'm um, differentiating the circuit, the signal coming in. I'm finding the slope of the signal coming in. So if I have a sine wave going in, what do I have going out? Well, the derivative of the sine wave is cosine, so I'd have a cosine wave coming out. It would look sort of like I had a wave 90 degrees out of phase, okay? but really what I have is a cosine wave. Summing amplifier. I look at this amplifier and I have a virtual ground sitting at the negative input. I have current flowing through both, all three resistors. All three of those currents have to be added together. They all have to go through the feedback resistor. My output is going to be the addition of those three currents. And depending on what I have, R1, R2, R3, and RF2, uh, it would sum those values. But it could, because it could have amplification going on, it could sum it at a times two value or a times four value. So I could, I could have this guy be uh, 10K, that guy be 10K, 20K, 30K, 
10K, uh, 10K, 20K, 40K, and now I'm going to do a digital signal to an analog signal conversion based on, on how I'm multiplying my signals together. And here we do. Here we have an analog, a digital to analog converter. So I, I've got the most significant bit, and I have the least significant bit, and they are a power of two apart. And I have an output that's now going to give me an output that's an analog output for the digital input. Now it's going to be a stepped analog output, right? But it's still going to be analog. And um, now I'm, I'm doing a summing amplifier where uh, I'm summing all three together. And I'm going to find the average. Okay, so I'm going to find the average of the three signals. All right. Summing amplifiers. Difference amplifiers. I'm, I'm looking at the, the difference between V2 and V1 and coming out with the, what it is. Well, that seems like a pretty simple thing. Uh, my, this is an <coughs> instrumentation amplifier. So I've got a hospital setting where they have buco much money and I'm doing instruments for them, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use a regular amplifier to take care of your IV. I'm going to use a, a instrumentation operational amplifier, which will do the same thing that the operational amplifier will do, but only at four or five times the cost. And then we justify that because isn't your life worth it? Yeah, it sounds to me like a scam, probably is. But uh, that's what we do. So we end up putting three operational amplifiers together on the same chip, giving you the same input pins and output pins we had before, calling it an instrumentation amplifier so that you can pay more for it. Okay, And in theory, your heart monitor is going to work better. It's going it's to have better common mode rejection ratio. It's going to have a better frequency response. It's going to have better all things across the board. Um, but in fact, it's only on the margins, and we're just selling the guys who bill of goods. But that's fine. So the, the instrument is going to have a high gain. We had a high gain before. It had a high common mode rejection ratio. We had that before. It can detect and amplifier low-level signals. Well, we could do that before, right? So now we're, we're, we're pushing the envelope by 1 or 2 percent and selling the people a, a bill of goods. Oh, end with that. Well, I think that we should do um, the homework for Chapter 22. And because my toy is still not working, we will do it on the board. What do you think? Oh, that'd be a bummer, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, I, I don't believe I said that. We're going to do it on the board. Um, is, my, is my video capture thing on now? I never turned it back on, did I? No. Nope. Shit. That's funny, too. All right. All right. Yeah. Come on, Steve. So, what? Yeah, Fred supposed to tell me these things. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we get rid of this garbage. Also known as garbage. Well, I got uh, I got two pages of the IVs of mine that, uh, that, that on the, the five week grades are uh, got some amount of unsettled. Show people who are in the same on the list. One, what? Connor, two. I don't want to. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
The first guy on the list, I'm, I'm looking at his name, I can't even pronounce it, I don't know who he is. He's in business math and, and, and elements of writing. Yeah. And then two of them are, uh, are Seth and, uh, and Eric, both of which got dumped off the, the uh, thing due to lack of payment. And so uh, Seth Peters, not going to Seth. And so if both of those guys were removed from my two pages, because if every single class was on at once, right? then I'd only have one page. <laughs> and so it just went on and on. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, yeah, you're only on there twice. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Something's wrong. You're only on there twice. You should demand better. But that's okay. Most of you will be on there this time because you didn't bother to turn in your lab book. Am I on that one of those lists, Doug? Oh, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How could you be this? Why are they on the list? Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was the list. Yeah. The amplifier in problem three has a voltage gain of 120, determining the maximum frequency input voltage for the circuit. Okay, so you're going to have a Determine the maximum in the answer. You think it's 2250. So there's 2250, right? So I got I got something that looks like this. Okay. Maybe I, I probably don't need these these values. The voltage gain is 120. Why can I tell you that? Maximum allowable peak to peak voltage for the system. Okay, so the output, output because I'm at plus and minus 10, so I'm at plus or minus 10, so that means I could have. 10 divided by 120, 10 divided by 120 on the minus side. Um, anybody got a calculator? Seven drop across one of the diodes inside there. So I'm going to go with 9.3 divided by 120. And now I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get uh, 77 and a half million volts minus 77 and a half million volts. So there's nothing wrong with that answer. There's nothing wrong with overthinking the problem and getting that. Unless, of course, it's a multiple choice thing. Oh, um, the, the brilliant people in the Calculus 2 class, Physics, Physics 2, Calculus Based Physics 2 class, I have a capacitor. And um, they're a distance, I'm a distance of B apart on two parallel plates. And in the center, my, I have an electric field of E. These things are going to be apart. If I go and I place them closer together at B <coughs> over 2, what is the uh, electric field halfway between? That was the question. It's a multiple choice test. So A, B over 2, B, 2, B, 3, 4 e let's see, e, 8 e. That, that was, that was the, their choices. Right. 
Anybody got the right answer? See. So the answer is no. No one has the right answer. Hey. Like I said, no one has the right answer because none of these answers are right. <laughs> <laughs> the right answer is it's so easy. See, two parallel planes, it doesn't matter if I'm this far apart or that far apart. What matters is if, if I'm close to the edge, or if I'm, if, if, but if, I, if, the distance, if this distance is small compared to how big the plate is, it's going to be E at the center. Just like it's going to be zero on the outside, because it's going to cancel on the outside no matter where it is. But uh, as long as I'm not close to the top where something weird is happening, where the plates are ending, I'm going to be, if it's E here, it's going to be E there. Well, I thought you were side to side. You I thought have. I said C, but I really said E? Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 so, uh, do I get this board back? Yep. All right. Yeah, you can do a lot of next. Now, these are, these are all supposed to be really simple. And, uh, to you. Well, that first one was pretty simple. That first one was pretty simple. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah, I didn't know that Not was. Not <laughs> Determine the maximum operating frequency. Right. So I've got uh, a yeah, yeah, smooth rate. Analysis. 
What is that? Uh, anybody know? Um, a lot of work. <coughs> the form so, uh, well, it the means that we have to perform an analysis. No, it's a good thing. Oh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Let's see that. Let's see that. There we go. Page 770. So, if you need analysis, you need to know the closed loop game. You need to know the common mode rejection ratio. Common mode rejection ratio. And you need to know the frequency max. Oh, we got the frequency max wrong. We have a problem. Uh, frequency we max. Uh, frequency max is the, the skew rate divided by two pi to the frequency. So in your last problem, we were supposed to have over 0 0.8. 0 0.8, yeah. 0 0.8 divided by the frequency. Close for another second, two pi. And the peak frequency would be 15, right? Not 30. And didn't I put 300 in there? Yeah, you Yeah. Oh, where did I get that 300 from? I don't know. From the problem. The box out, bro. From the problem. Yeah. Go Rogers! Come on. What's this slap? You need to rely on you all. Don't rely on me. That's the right hand in front of me. That's both his gain on the side right now. So then it's not 15. <laughs> so back to number 11. Let's put in the only book. Put in the only book. Back on problem number 11. <laughs> <laughs> That's for 11. <laughs> <laughs> I, hose us, right? I hose it over really Let me just erase this. So I have a point zero 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 one. Yeah. Divided by 2. Divided by pi. Divided by point zero two four. Yeah, 
Well, a few of them. We've really been to there twice. So um, it looks like I got um, one divided by four pi times 10 to the minus six. Well, that would be easy enough for them to have one divided by four. Is if I have 
Yes. Thank you. 
Robert, why my toy isn't working? Um, it's because it's because, it's because Oh, I don't know. Can you just get one of those too? Yeah. Maybe it's your computer. Just try plugging it onto. What? Oh, it's a sensitivity issue? Yeah, okay.